So, um, as I said, there's a last minute uh, change in title because um, we actually didn't didn't uh, progress far enough to for me to to talk about the multi-level part. So I only will give an, an outlook in what we're going to do. Um, and so I start with adaptive stochastic collocation. Um, and this is a joint work with my PhD student here in Vienna, um, Andreas Calioni. Oh, yes. So, and I will start with probably the most common slide in recent years, um, the description of the, of the random Poisson problem. And it's just here to, of course, you know the setting all too well. It's just here to tell you that we, we have we used this, 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 the simplest setting here that you could imagine. So we have the, the Poisson problem with, a, with an random coefficient, which de depends in an affine way on some bounded independent random variables, for example, uniform random variables. Right? So the, the important thing is that the, the, um, they are bounded. Um, and of course, we're interested in the in the many dimensions case, um, so n might be large. So recently, there has have been quite a lot um, results on the stochastic Galerkin uh, adaptive stochastic Galerkin approach to this problem. So where you treat the random variable just as an addition to your Galerkin space, and you have a Galerkin method in the physical space and in the random parameter domain and recently there have been some optimality results so um, for example by Michele Ruggieri who is here in the back in the room but also by, by Alex Bespalov so that's the same paper um, Catherine Powell and others um, and and here uh, I will be talking about the stochastic collocation approach where we essentially just use sampling solve this problem. So as you know, of course, we rewrite this problem into the parameterized version, and that's what we will be talking about. So why the parameter will be in this tensor product space, which is just a tensor product of some, some intervals in the simplest case. OK, um, so there, there are essentially two, two things we could consider. The first one is the semi, what, what we call the semi-discrete approximation where we just try to approximate the map from the parameter space into uh, the solution space of the PD, right? So we do not care about the spatial approximation with the finite element method. Um, so what we do is we, we sample the solution in our solution space. So that would be the exact solution, but you could also imagine some fixed fine finite element grid, right? Um, and then we perform parametric enrichment. So we, we add sample points to, to uh, increase the accuracy of the solution. And we do that in an adaptive way. And independently to our work, very similar results uh, came out uh, by, by Eigel and co-workers. Uh, almost within a week of our results, they published theirs. And, and that's also what they do. They, they go in a, a slightly different direction but they also consider this semi-discrete approach where they approximate the, the parameter to solution map. So what we did uh, extra is we also consider the fully discrete approximation where we do collocation plus finite element approximation in an adaptive way. So uh, this means for each sample point, uh, we have to approximate the exact solution with some adaptive finite element scheme which produces then an adaptive finite element mesh, which we call tau y, which uh, corresponds, of course, to the sample point y. And this space here, S10, is just the standard finite element space, so piecewise linear on triangles. So that's what we call the fully discrete approximation. OK, and of course, you, you all know that stochastic collocation is very flexible in the sense that you, you don't for, to implement the algorithm, you don't need to know anything about the equation, right? You, you just need to be able to solve it, um, and which is an inherent advantage of a stochastic Galerkin, where you need to know much more. But um, our analysis, on the other hand, uh, relies fundamentally on this well-known regularity result that, that the parameter to solution map is analytic. 
and, and, and analytic in a very nice way. So it's even almost dimension independently analytic uh, because this allows us to do interpolation with exponential um, convergence of the error. Um, so, so this result shouldn't be too surprising if, um, if, if you think of Chebyshev interpolation here, so you will be the interpolation operator, um, then you get some exponential convergence rate depending on the polynomial degree m here. And the exponential convergence rate depends only on the, on the size of the holomorphic extension, on the size of the domain of the holomorphic extension of the function. And for our model problem, we, it, it's well known that this, of course, this extension is there. Um, okay, so how, how does the, the approximation work? Um, we consider uh, the sparse grid interpolant as so most standard um, with those hierarchical surpluses, which are just um, different 1D differences of interpolation operators. Right, so here in the in the index you have the dimension, um, the number of the dimension, and in the in the uh, the upper index now is is the polynomial degree, um, or at least the, the the index of the polynomial degree. Um, and then we tensorize those, we get the hierarchical so plus surplus and and here we have the sparse grid interpolant so the idea is if you let j run in the full multi index set n to the n then you get the identity um, and, and now the point is to pick appropriate indices to to get a, a good sparse grid interpolant here so here you have one one example in 2d if you pick those red points as your multi index set and you will get this sparse grid here just as an example and, and actually for this to be interp an interpolation, so to be interpolatory, you need the index set to be downward closed. Very, again, a very standard um, assumption. Okay, um, so if we have that, what are the properties of our, of our sparse grid interpolant? First, if our node family, so, for example, think of the Chebyshev nodes, are nested in 1D, the resulting sparse grid interpolant is in interpolatory, right? Um, so we need the nestedness. So this would be the node family of degree M, or let's say of level M and of level M plus one, the degree can differ from the M as we will see in a second. Um, so we have interpolation property and the, and the second, um, important property is the Lebesgue constant. And there's this nice result by, by um, Cohen, Schwab and coworkers um, that, that basically the, the sparse grid interpolant inherits the Lebesgue constant of the 1D interpolant, right? So if the 1D interpolant has Lebesgue constant M to theta, if, if M is the polynomial degree, um, then the sparse grid interpolant will have essentially number of multi-index, uh, number of points in the multi-index set to theta plus one. So it gets slightly worse, but the important thing is it's algebraic and not exponential. That's, that's the important thing. Yes. Yes. You mean it will blow up in the sparse grid? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thanks for the comment, yes. Um, so, okay. So, but the, yeah. In the end for us, it's important that the, that the, the, the Lebesgue constant of the sparse grid interpolant is now algebraic and not exponential. That's what I meant. So of course you need to you need to have nested node families, and, and that's actually not that easy. So one one property uh, one example would be to use those nested Chebyshev points. Actually, 
those are not really the, the classical Chebyshev points, which would be the series of the Chebyshev polynomials, but those are the, ex the extreme of the Chebyshev polynomials, which have kind of shifted by one. And, and those are nested if I double the number of points in each step, right? So um, they are nested if I, I, for the next larger set, I take 2m and then 4m and so on. So that's, that's called what's called the doubling rule. I don't know if you invented this term, Fabio, it's from your paper. Um, another example would be leisure, leisure nodes, um, which have a very nice construction actually. Um, so if you, you, you start with one arbitrary starting point and to generate the next point, you just um, maximize this quantity here. So you, in a way you maximize the distance to all your previous points. <laughs> And there you put the next point. And that's that's what called leisure nodes. And you can also show that they have this desired property. And, and here the advantage is that, that you can actually increase your, your set of interpolation nodes by one um, and still get nestedness. The disadvantage is that uh, this, this, this problem is not, not so straightforward to solve. So you don't you do not have explicit formulas for your nodes. Okay. So let's come to the adaptive algorithm, um, the parametric enrichment algorithm. So how does it work? Um, we assume we already have picked an index, a multi-index set for our sparse grid interpolant, and then we define the margin, which would be just the hollow points here. Uh, yeah. So essentially, we consider um, points which neighbor our index set in the cardinal direction. So we do not go diagonally because, of course, this would be way too expensive in high dimensions. Um, so that would be our margin. And in this margin, we compute uh, an error estimator. And here we use this error estimator by, uh, by Nobile. Um, um, actually, relatively recently introduced. And the nice thing about this uh, error estimator is that it's reliable. So it's an upper bound for the error. There are other error estimators for this problem, for example, by, by Grieber, uh, which have some nice properties as well, but they, they are not um, reliable, reliable. So no upper bound for the error. Um, and the pointwise error estimator is quite simple. So we, we use the, the sparse grid interpolant of the solution uh, compute the gradient because we're in the H1 setting. And then we compute this hierarchical surplus corresponding to this point or to one of the points in the margin. Right? And, and, and from that, we compute the L infinity norm or, or any other LP norm that's actually not so critical. And that's the error estimator. Of course, to compute the L infinity norm, you need to do some sampling as well. So uh, that's that's. Uh, something we, we actually ignore in the analysis that we have to approximate the L-infinity norm as well. Okay, and then the algorithm is quite straightforward. So we assume we have some something that's called profit. I will talk about that in a second. Um, we search for the ma profit maximizer in the margin, add this to the index set, and then make the index set downward closed again. Right, so we add we add those two points here, and then we get the new sparse grid and compute the next error estimator. Could be that here, the, the maximizer, um, and so on. Right. So, what's the profit now? The profit is actually you, um, not something which is strictly defined. You, you have some some leeway here, but it should be a measure of the error reduction per computational cost added. So, actually, what we do is we um, we take the size of the error estimator divided by the cost necessary to add this index set at this, this point. So for example, for this point, we would add, we would um, additionally consider the cost of adding those two points, because of course we have to do that in order to make the set down closed. Um, and, and this is actually something which complicates the analysis quite a bit, because we do not know a priori how many points we have to add in order to make the set down work closed again. So heuristically, you would expect this point to maximize the error or, or this point. So some point in what's called the reduced margin. 
So this is just a margin. If you add it, then the set is still downward closed. Um, because heuristically, this should be larger than this one, but actually you cannot prove that. And, and uh, you can construct count the examples, of course. Um, okay. Um, okay, and here, uh, here's the first main result. Um, we show that this adaptive algorithm I just presented drives the error estimator to zero. So that's, that's the result, right? Um, of course, this is not, not um, trivial because we do not know uh, which, which, index set, uh, which index points are, are selected, right? And here's the fundamental idea of the proof. Um, the first one is we can show that the error estimate is uniformly bounded. This follows immediately from the regularity of the parameter to solution map. The second point that we use is that we assume that the profits go to zero. And this is a very simple um, implication of the fact that the work grows, right? The profit is, is error gain divided by work, essentially, and the work just grows. If I add more and more index points, the work will grow to infinity. That means the profit goes to zero. And those are the only two ingredients we actually need. Um, and, and this is then, then the result, right? Um, if we have those, or well, that's not the end result, but that's, that's one important um, um, ingredient. If we know that the profit goes to zero, and if we assume that some index uh, point in the index set stays in the margin for all adaptive steps, so it's never selected, it's always in the, in the, in the set where it could be chosen, but it's never selected. Then those two properties imply that the error estimator goes to zero. We, we can actually show that at some point it is zero. So it, it will be zero at some specific point, not only convergence to zero. Um, so essentially, if an error estimator for an index is non-zero, then at some point it will be selected. That's the message here. Um, and with this, you can prove convergence of the error estimator, and, and that's the proof. So, so this is your error estimator, just rewritten in a slightly different way. Um, here we, we sum up over the full multi-index set, and here we have an indicator function over the margin. Uh, so that's just re, uh, uh, the, the old error estimator rewritten. Um, and now we use dominated convergence. Um, a similar idea is also in the work by Bespalov and, and Bocieri and Pretorius. Um, we know that this is uniformly bounded. And we know that for any index, um, one of those three things happen. Either um, the index is eventually selected, right? Then it's not in the margin anymore, and this will be zero. Or for all L, it's never in the margin, right? then also this has to be zero, the product. Or third option, it's in the margin and never gets selected. And then the previous proposition just uh, showed us that then that the error estimate already has to be zero. Okay, so again, if an error estimate is non-zero, it eventually gets selected and, and therefore added to the index set. And that's the whole proof. And, and this shows us that this adaptive algorithm drives the error actually to zero. Okay, so this was for the semi-discrete algorithm. Now we go to the fully discrete algorithm where we also consider the finite element method. Um, so up to now, we approximated the exact solution or some very fine um, finite element approximation. Um, what we add now is we, we approximate for each um, sample point the solution with the finite element method. And, um, um, and we have to add of course, then a finite element error estimate. This is also already proposed in this paper here um, to do that. Um, okay, so capital UY now will be the finite element approximation for this parameter Y. And for this parameter Y, we will have a finite element mesh, which of course can depend on Y because we have an adaptivity here, right? So, and, and the algorithm is very simple. We just alternate 
parameter refinement and refining the finite element mesh. And so we do one step parameter refinement and a couple of steps, finite elements refinement. Um, and we will show that this will actually converge. Okay, um, so here is a quick overview of the finite element error estimators. Um, essentially, we have two versions we have. So let's start with that one. Um, essentially, it's just the sum of all the collocation points weighted with the norm of the, um, um, of the, of the basis functions of the sparse grid interpolant. Um, and here this eta i is, is just a standard residual error estimator for the finite element method. Um, you can see it here, each eta y is, is a sum of all the elements of the mesh, and then you have the residual term and the jump term. This is what you would expect from a finite element method. Here you have the definitions. Um, so that's very uh, straightforward. There's another option to use just one mesh for all the sample points, right? Um, then you get the slightly different error estimator where you essentially use the sparse grid interpolation of the residual and the sparse grid interpolation of the jumps. Um, when you decide that only one mesh for all the collocation points is good enough. Okay, so now how does the algorithm work? First, if you just decide that you want to have one adaptive mesh for all the sample points, you compute the single mesh error estimators, and then you do what it's known in the adaptive world as Durfler marking, which means you select a subset of your mesh, which contributes with a percentage theta to the total error. Right? Um, this is called Durfler marking, it's known to be optimal. And what we then can prove is that we have convergence of the algorithm. So the algorithm will, the adaptive algorithm will drive the error to zero. A similar result for multiple adaptive meshes. Here you have the error estimator, which depends, of course, on the sample point. And then you do something what you could call aggregated Durfel marking, which means you put all the meshes for all the sample points in one pot and select the largest error estimators, um, such that such a criterion is satisfied again. And and of course, and as I said before, we alternate between we alternate between parametric enrichment and finite element refinement. Um, and the idea is to refine the finite element mesh until it's bound, it's smaller than the parametric estimator times some multiplicative factor, which depends on the index set. So this is something polynomial in the, in the size of the index set. And if you do that correctly, then you get convergence. So you always want your finite element error to be a bit smaller than your parametric error, which makes sense because you kind of want to mimic the, the semi-discrete approach where you assume you have the exact solution. Okay, and then we prove convergence of single and multi-mesh algorithm of the adaptive algorithm. And actually we can prove much more. We can show that the spatial approximation converges even optimally in this sense. So this means um, that if you fix an index set and just drive the finite element adaptive algorithm, it will converge with the best possible rate S here with respect to the number of elements in your finite element meshes, okay? Um, okay, and here is some numerical result. Um, this is an inclusion problem. So you have those blocks here and they, they vary randomly. And then you, you, um, you, generate, you, you try to approximate the solution. And here you see, um, here you see a mesh. So actually that the colors here are the density of the, of the elements here. So you see that the, the singularities along those blocks are resolved quite nicely. And here you see the convergence rates. So in, in blue, you see the multi-mesh algorithm and in red, you see the single mesh adaptive algorithm. And it's actually quite interesting that the single mesh adaptive algorithm is much, much better than the multi-mesh adaptive algorithm. So even though you have more freedom in choosing different meshes for each collocation points, it seems to be much, much worse. And we are still not quite sure why this is the case, but we think that the, the the error estimator just really overestimates the error and leads to much uh, to, to too much refinement of the of the finite element meshes in the multi-mesh case. That's our suspicion. 
um, and we're working on, on, on an improved error estimator, which should not do that anymore. Um, but for that one, we, we cannot prove anything at the moment. Okay, so that's um, for the Poisson problem. Um, and now I want to talk about a more involved problem, which comes from computational micromagnetism, uh, which is called the Lander Lifshitz Gilbert equation. Um, it, it describes the motion of, of magnetization in a, in a magnetic body. And, and here it is. So it's essentially a parabolic equation. Um, why it's parabolic, you see here, HF contains the, the Laplacian of M. So M, sorry, M is the magnetization. It's a, a time-dependent vector field um, with fixed length. So M has length one. You see it maps in the unit sphere. And each point of the magnetic body has a direction of the magnetization. And the, the evolution of this magnetization is given by this equation. Um, and it's essentially a, a parabolic, nonlinear parabolic um, equation. Um, yeah, you see this effective field contains the Laplacian of M, it contains some external field, and it cont can contain many other lower order terms. For example, some material and anisotropy or some, uh, some other effects, which, which are interesting for physicists. And here you see the, the, the motion that you expect. The magnetization will precess around this effective field until it reaches a stable state. OK, and as I said, the magnetization has length 1. It's very easy to see, actually, if, if you scalar multiply this equation with m, you see that actually the, the length of the magnetization has to remain constant, and we set it to 1. Uh, this is used in magnetic recording to simulate hard drives. Um, and, and in order to simulate hard drives reliably, you want to consider the stochastic LLG equation, which is exactly the same equation as before, but we add this Stratonovich differential here, which uh, models um, heat motion in the, magnet, in the magnet, right? So all the atoms wiggle around a little bit, and this can actually flip magnetization. And if you talk about magnetic recording, you actually don't want that, right? You want your bits to stay, um, to stay stable. So that's why physicists are interested in this equation. Um, w is, is a Brownian motion, and G is some scaling factor for the Brownian motion. OK, and we again want to do stochastic collocation for this equation. And the first step to do that is to convert this equation again in a random PDE. And there's a very nice trick to do that uh, with, with this change of variable. So introducing, we introduce a new variable, small m, which is just e to Brownian motion times some operator g of the original solution. And then you can show that this resulting m solves this random PDE. Right, so this is now the LLG equation plus some right-hand side, which depends on the Brownian motion, but there's no stochastic differential in there anymore, which is, of course, nice because you gain a whole or uh, half an order of convergence rate uh, without doing anything. Um, and then um, what, what we do is we resolve the Brownian motion with this uh, levi cieleski expansion. So this means we have those hierarchical head function bases, and we have um, standard normals, normal coefficients here. And of course, we have to truncate the, the sum at some point, right? So that's that's the discretization. And and here is now the, the problem, which is actually uh, can be uh, approximated by stochastic collocation, which is the LLG equation plus this stochastic um, item side with the approximated Brownian motion. Um, okay, so yeah, and I said we want to do stochastic collocation. So uh, that's exactly the same as before. The only um, the only new thing is that, of course, we cannot use the finite element method anymore for uh, approximating the spatial um, samples because this is a time dependent PDE and it's actually not non trivial to solve. So um, what we want is, and now we also have an unbounded parameter space. So what we want is we want approximation in the on R with some uh, Gaussian weight here, 
right? So that's that's the one D case. And what you can use there again are Leisha nodes. On R, they are constructed exactly as I said before. So you maximize the distance to the uh, points you already have to generate a new point. The only difference now is that you have a weight here. So you don't you want to maximize the probability of your nodes to be close to zero. Um, and that's what we use. And then we do stochastic colocation again with sparse grids. And here's some examples how those sparse grids now look um, with those weighted leisure nodes. Okay, um, what you can prove is that if your parameter to solution map is smooth enough, those weighted laser nodes will give you algebraic convergence again, as you would expect. The problem is that you don't know much about the regularity of the parameter to solution map because and the Lifshitz Gilbert is a nonlinear equation. And even though the, the, the randomness is just in the right hand side, and not really in the coefficient, um, it doesn't work as easy as for the Poisson problem to get analytic, analyticity and something like that. So that's, that's a really non trivial problem here. Um, the second problem is you need to solve the equation. And what we do here is we, we use. Um, we use a method developed in joint work with, with Giorgio Zakrivis and, and, and Christian Lubich and Balash Kovac um, from last year, where we developed higher order time stepping methods for the deterministic LLG equation. And it turns out that they also work for the stochastic LLG equation. Um, the problem is. Those convergence results here only hold under quite severe regularity assumptions on the exact solution. And we don't know much about those, about the regularity of the exact solution. There's some, uh, some, some theorem together with Tan Tran from a couple of years ago where we proved that the exact solution can be arbitrarily smooth if the initial value is close enough to a constant. Um, but this is only for the det deterministic equation. Um, and it's also not a very interesting solution if the initial value is very close to constant, you know, because yeah, it, the solution then, then just decays to the steady state. Um, but that's the only result there is. So, so this is another problem with this equation. Okay. Um, I have five minutes left or something. Okay. Then I will skip this. You know the difference between single level and multi-level. I'm just showing some numerical experiments uh, that it really works. Um, so what we have here is we solve the stochastic LLG equation with non-constant initial condition, but constant function G. So that was the scaling on the Brownian motion. And, and we compare the single level approach um, with the multi-level approach. So here in blue, you have the single level. In red, you have the multi-level. Um, and you see it, it, it gives you a, a tremendous advantage. Um, if, if you look at the computational cost here, it's extremely expensive to solve this equation. So here we have more than 10 to the nine unknowns and, and we can get a much better error with just 10 to the eight unknowns, which is still a lot, but, but it's manageable. Um, and, and here, this plot is just to show you that the finite element error and the stochastic collocation error are on, on the same level, more or less. So we're not, we're not computing constants here. Um, this is just if we consider um, time stepping and, and stochastic collocation as our levels, right? So we gain, gain half an order. Um, if we include the spatial refinement, we only we only get uh, one fifth of an order um, because you, you just have more uh, dimensions in your problem, right? So that's expected. But still, there is quite an advantage over the single level problem. Um, and finally, what I want to show, I, I told you we have higher order methods. And you might ask, what's the point of a higher order method if I have a Brownian motion? Um, because you don't have the regularity. And that's what you see here, right? Red is the higher order scheme on the orig original problem and we just have order one with a better constant. Um, but the point is with this LLG equation, 
nobody really knows what's the correct randomness here. People use Brownian motions, but there's, there's not really a good argument to do that. Or there are arguments, but there are also arguments for other random types of randomness. And so we just said, if we replace the Brownian motion with something smoother, like the integrated Brownian motion, can we get this higher order? And, and indeed, that works. Um, and that is all I wanted to say. So thanks. Thank you very much.